I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. You're listening to the only story that matters. It's one story written by one guy and recorded in one single flawless take. Scald is a serialized tale. This episode picks up exactly where the last one left off. But you don't need to worry about starting at the beginning. Nope, you can jump in right here. Then, after I've got my hooks in you, you can check out what you've missed by listening to the previous podcast episodes or by buying the prose volumes exclusively on Amazon. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald. Part 75. Ho was shocked, floored, flabbergasted, and dumbfounded. It had been years since he'd seen him. Years upon years. Decades since he'd laid eyes upon him. And in those decades... Ho knew that he himself had changed, had grown older and grayer, his bones twisted and gnarled underneath skin taken by wrinkles, beneath muscles taken by atrophy. He knew that he was no longer the same man. He knew that time had changed him, had left him changed as time does to all men. But even then, he was shocked by how time had ravaged the man that sat before him. So very much older, older even than the decades that had passed him by, time weighed heavily upon him. He was aged aged in the way that comes only from long, hard years. But more than that, he was changed, his bare body sunken and twisted, that once proud chest grown concave, his powerful limbs turned to spindles. He was degraded, and yet, in a way that Ho could not articulate, did not even want to acknowledge, he had been... Improved upon, changed in ways that both corrupted and bettered, with dismay welling up in those glowing green fey eyes, Ho looked upon his student and spoke his name, the name that he had given him, the only name he had ever referred to him as. Mouse? The word scalded the vermin prince. It was a name he had not heard in ages, a name that he had struggled to forget, had forced down into the darkest recesses of a mind taken by blackness. When it struck his eardrums, it sent involuntary shivers up and down his spine, and his face twisted in response, giving itself over to something angry and feral, something that Ho could not remember ever having seen in his former student, but the look still managed to terrify him. In its familiarity... The vermin prince clenched his eyes shut, turning his face into a mask of pursed, pensive fury and disgust. He swallowed hard, choking down the bile that his former name had summoned up within him. That, that is not... He stammered confused and frustrated, before regaining his composure, his eyelids rising to reveal a pair of beady eyes from which all anger had been drained, leaving only a cold, calculating, palpable hatred. I 
and the vermin prince. And I am no longer content with scraps. The vermin prince stretched out his long, emaciated limbs and clumsily forced himself to his feet, unashamed of his nakedness, staring his former teacher in the eye until Ho had no choice but to turn away in his own shame. When he turned back, the incense that filled the room, that hazy pink smoke, it had coalesced, wrapping itself around the vermin prince's body, covering him and clothing him in a shimmering, squalid, otherworldly cloak. You are lucky, lucky that we are alone. The vermin prince turned from his altar of filth and allowed a cruel grin to spread across his face. Here, in my kingdom, the wages for disrespecting the vermin prince, they are difficult to pay. Without any warning, the vermin prince began to move but though his motions were sudden, they were not quick, as all of the speed and agility that Ho had so prized in his former student. They were gone. They were nowhere to be found, because the strength, the mass, the warmth that used to fill his gaze, those weren't the only things that the vermin prince had lost. They were far from the only things he had lost. Ho winced. And his heart ached as he looked upon his former student's leg, a limb that once rippled with strength and power, but that was now broken and twisted, and where it wasn't covered in oozing blisters. It was colored a sickly shade of gray. Come. The vermin prince spoke without looking at his former teacher dragging his crippled right leg behind him as he staggered into the darkness. We have much to discuss, Master Ho. With seemingly no other options before him, knowing the task assigned to him, and, most significantly, consumed by curiosity, with questions as to what had happened to his most promising pupil, Ho obeyed, and he followed the vermin prince in to the darkness. Mao, Ho caught himself. My prince, it has been such a very long time. Ho walked carefully, slowly, deliberately, struggling to keep his eyes trained on the figure that lurched through the darkness before him, the one whose shoulders he could barely see rising and falling in silent, secret laughter. Longer than you realize, Master Ho. Suddenly, the vermin prince disappeared around a corner, a corner that Ho could not even see, could only assume to exist from the way the darkness consumed his guide. But as he himself rounded that corner, keeping one hand trained upon the wall so as not to lose himself in the blackness, Ho's vision was assaulted by a clear white light. With one hand still on the wall, he raised his other to his eyes, shielding them from the blinding glow that now surrounded him as he found himself once again in a winding stone corridor, one lit by endless torches and one down which the vermin prince now continued dragging himself. Ho oh, was an awe because though the tunnel slanted downward precipitously, 
though its floor was rough, uneven, and littered with treacherous patches of slick wetness, the vermin prince forged ahead. Fearlessly. He didn't even equip himself with a staff or a cane, didn't even try to steady himself upon the wall at his side, and instead simply hopped and limped, grunting and cringing with every step. Ho, oh, his curiosity reaching a fever pitch, spoke gently, desperate to learn more, while avoiding offense. What? What happened to you? The vermin prince slowed as he responded. The same thing that happens whenever a boy is sent off to war. Suddenly, he turned and looked back at Ho, his beady eyes like daggers as he spat out his answer. I was broken. Though he moved as quickly as he could down the corridor, chasing after his former student, Ho found that it was impossible to catch up to the vermin prince, despite the fact that his pace was slow, halting, and awkward. So they traversed those endless hallways, Ho ever behind, straining to hear those grumbling, hateful, poison-laced words as the vermin prince told his tale. Proctors. They knew that I was your favorite. They knew that I was the best. So they treated me well. Treated me like a farmer does his prized calf. They fed me well. They clothed me better. And they gave me a battalion of what they called soldiers, but were mostly boys and old men, those previously passed over for military service. We, your students, those trained by your inimitable hand, we were sent to the front where we were meant to hold the line, to defend Ravenna, and to beat the centaur horde back into the wilderness that it spawned it. At least, that was the plan. That is what we were meant to do. We were meant to use our exquisite technique, your exquisite technique, to use our martial prowess, to use it in service of Ravenna, in service of the Lady of Ravenna, to defend her and her city, to stand proudly as Calaria's chosen warriors. But we, we were no warriors. We were not proud soldiers. We were nothing more than Bait, a distraction, a sacrifice to the unappeasable centaur horde. We were unprepared, wholly unprepared. And they, the proctors, they did nothing to prepare us, nothing to help us, nothing to warn us of the doom that thundered across the plains toward us. We expected to fight men. Men fused with horses, yes, but men all the same. We expected to face down an army. But what we saw instead was a stampede. We manned the walls together. Your students the boys, the old men, the proctors, what remained of the soldiery, the officers, even Calaria's appointees, her cronies, those placed in charge of Ravenna's arrondissements, those to whom their protection, their well-being had been entrusted. We stood together. We stood shoulder to shoulder. But that mighty line, 
that unified front of Ravenna's finest, her boldest, her bravest, all that she had left, standing proudly upon her walls. When we were but merely touched by the centaur horde, merely touched by them, our defense was broken, shattered, decimated. We couldn't hold the line. We couldn't hold the walls. It was impossible. Any fool could see it. And every fool, every one of us foolish enough to have thought in terms of honor, in terms of civic pride, in terms of noble sacrifice, we all saw it. But still, still we believed. We still believed in our cause, in what we were doing. We believed falsely that our sacrifice could ever be noble, could ever be anything other than what it was. The province of slaves and cowards. Because those we sacrificed ourselves for, those for whom we put ourselves in harm's way, put ourselves in the centaur's way, those for whom we flung our bodies in front of the crushing wave of hooves and staves and arrows, they were not worth sacrificing for. The appointees, the officers, the proctors, they weren't worth sacrificing ourselves for because we weren't sacrificing ourselves. We had already been bound and placed upon the altar we had been cleansed and anointed prepared and made ready as a sacrifice and though it was the centaurs that did the deed the centaurs that wielded the knife it was they it was our betters who willingly offered us up and so as we Still under our illusions, still under the sway of Calarius corrupting magics, still held in bondage by that horrible witch, we attempted to stand our ground. We attempted to defend the walls, to force back the centaurs, to work with those who had directed us there, who had placed us in harm's way. But when we when your students, the boys and the old men, the simple people who fought to defend their homes because they had nowhere else to go. When we look back, when we turn to check in on those who fought with us, on those we thought to be united with us in a shared cause. We saw nothing. All we saw were clouds of Dust as the appointees, as the officers, as the proctors, as they all turned tail, craven manipulators that they were, and they fled. They ran. They retreated. It was we, those with nothing left to lose, those who could only ever hope to beg for scraps at Ravenous table. It was us who were left to defend their retreat, to defend their city, to be struck down, trampled, and murdered by the centaur horde. The very walls crumbled underneath our feet, weakened and laid low by the incessant pounding of the centaur's hooves. And as they fell, as they shattered and broke, as those of us still standing struggled to remain so, fought to land on our feet and avoid the falling rubble, I looked around at the battalion that I commanded. The two young boys, the two old men, those with no prospects and even fewer dreams, I watched as they, seeing what little hope they had evaporate, I watched as they, content to choke on their master's dust, content to chase after their betters and beg for scraps, I watched as they too turned tail and ran. But I, I was no coward. I was no craven weakling. 
I was the finest student of the great Master Ho. I'd studied under the most accomplished, the most revered of Ravana's seven masters. I was disappointed that they had chosen to run, chosen to flee, but I didn't blame them. There was no resentment in my heart. Not yet. No, I understood, though I could never fathom exhibiting that degree of cowardice. Still, I sympathized. And what's more, I still wanted, desperately, to help them. And in my own foolishness, in my own confusion, in my own ignorance of the world and the way it works, the way it truly works, I mistakenly thought that the best way to aid them, to support them, to give them what they needed, was to help them run. So that's what I did. That's exactly what I did. I steadied my feet upon the ground, upon that broken earth littered with what remained of the shattered walls. I took up my strongest, most versatile stance, and I prepared to do as you had taught me. I prepared to give myself over to the rhythmless dance, to be unpredictable, to give where I should take and to sit where I should stand. I steeled myself for battle. I prepared to face an endless horde of half-man, half-horse monstrosities. But that, that's exactly where I failed. Because the centaurs, that frothing horde, they didn't want to do battle. They didn't want to stand and fight. They only wanted to charge, to stampede, to destroy, to batter man's works into the ground, to summon up the wilderness that had birthed them, and that would, if they had their way, retake the entirety of this pitiful, forsaken border realm. And so my preparations. My base assumption that the centaurs wished to fight me. They were in vain, as the centaurs simply charged around me, rushing into the city with club and with flame. They ignored my strikes, both distracting and mercy, and they parted around me like a rock in a stream, until eventually their numbers too huge, their speed too great, the field too crowded, one barreled into me, knocking me to the ground. They trampled me. Their hooves fell again and again, and they beat me into the ground. They made to grind me into dust, a fine powder that would disappear into the dirt. It felt like an eternity as the hooves struck me again and again, as I fought to use what you had taught me, fought to avoid the strikes, and somehow, impossibly... Make my way back up to my feet. But it was hopeless. It was impossible. Because those hooves, the ones that pounded down again and again, that infinite rain of hooves, they were not strikes. They were not premeditated acts. They themselves were part of a type of trance, the ecstatic state that propelled that endless horde forward. And as such, there was no mind behind them, no mind to distract, no mind to confuse and bamboozle with Master Ho's tricks. After a lifetime of agony, after an endless sea of hooves, finally, mercifully, it stopped. The hooves stopped falling, around me at least, and the sounds of the pounding, crumbling earth were replaced by screams, by the centaur's wild chants, and by the crackling of hungry flame devouring what remained of that once 
vibrant here in these months. And I, I was left alone, was left alone to suffer and die. My fellow students, my makeshift battalion, all dead or fled, all gone in one way or another. I was left alone with a shattered, broken, useless leg. I was left a cripple. Me, your finest student, laid low not by centaurs. Yes, by centaurs. And yes, by those that forced me to fight them. But more than anything, I had been laid low by my own foolishness, by my own ignorance, by my insistence that there was still nobility in this fallen world. But as you well know, Master Ho, as you have no doubt learned in the many years since last we met, that is not the case. There is no nobility. There is no honor. There is only what you are given and what you can take. What they tell you is yours and what is rightfully so. I didn't know it then. Not yet. But I would learn it. I would learn it very, very well. And my lessons... They started with the kernel of knowledge, with a simple realization, with a glimpse of the truth. As night fell, as I writhed on the ground in agony, struggling to marshal my senses in the wake of my brush with death, fighting through the pain of my ruined leg as the shadows of the burning city played tricks on my eyes. It was then, it was then, I saw the truth. And that truth, the truth was that there was no nobility. There was no honor. There was nothing worth fighting for, worth dying for. Nothing made by someone else. Nothing in service of anyone else. None of it was worth anything but the ashes to which the centaurs had reduced that convulsing arrondissement. Though before I would have seen it as an act of unforgivable cowardice, of cruelty even, to leave Ravenna to the horde while I still drew breath into my quivering lungs. For the first time, I saw it for what it really was. Self-preservation. The officers had done it. The proctors had done it. The city itself had done it. Had run away. Had contracted its borders. Had flung myself and others at the horde in a desperate attempt to cover their own retreat. They had fled. They had recognized what mattered. And they had protected it. And now, for the first time, it was my turn to do the same so, with my dying leg racked by excruciating pain, pain that still, to this very day, shoots up my spine whenever I think back, a grisly reminder of the day that I was born again, the day that I acknowledged my true self, that I became what I am, what I truly am, what I was meant to be, with the fires of that burning city lighting my way, I reached out with my exhausted, bruised, and broken arms, and I dragged myself across the shattered earth. At first, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't need to know. All I knew was what I was moving away from. The flaming Arondisement. 
The sinful, corrupting, corrupted city of Ravenna. The unholy conflagration that had come, finally, mercifully, to devour that oppressive city-state. I moved away, slowly, pitifully, dragging myself across the ground like the slug, like the vermin that I had not become, but had been revealed to have always been. Whether I knew it or not, whether I believed it or not, they knew the truth. Ravenna knew the truth, and they had left me with nothing but scraps. Master Ho wanted to speak, wanted to ask questions, wanted to, more than anything, understand the wild tale that his former student revealed to him. But he could not, because as they walked, though the vermin prince moved as haltingly, as awkwardly as ever, though Ho ran as fast as he could, though his lungs ached and he panted for breath, he could not catch up with his guide, who continued, forging ahead in his tail as he delved deeper and deeper into those winding hallways. In their jaundiced light, I crawled away from Ravenna, crawled away from the flickering orange flame and the thick, acrid smoke that rose from it. I crawled steadily across the earth, crawled into the darkness, willingly, eagerly, until suddenly that darkness, that unspeakable blackness, was cut, was broken, was illuminated by a warm, beckoning light, a yellow light, a light that promised a power elusive and confounding. The centaurs. Their hooves, their primal atavistic rhythms, the ones they pounded into the earth to fell our walls, they had opened up something else. A cavern, a system of caves, bathed in yellow, bathed in light, engorged with the strength that had been trampled, just as I had, that had been forsaken, just as I had, that had been discarded and forgotten, just as I had. But that had, instead of weakening, instead of dissipating, instead of scattering to the four winds, had grown strong, just as I would. Unable to walk, barely able to crawl another inch, I pulled myself to the precipice, pulled myself to the edge of that yellow light, of that jagged hole in the ground, the one torn open by the very stampede that had laid me low. And with no other option, with no other hope, with nothing left to stand for, even if I could stand. I pulled myself forward one final time. And I fell in. I fell for ages, just as you did. I fell through the discarded and the destroyed, through the refuse and the rubble, and I landed, battered, broken, undignified, and forgotten. In a pile of filth, I fell amongst the trash and the orger. I fell, as you did, into exactly that which I had become. I was useless. I was filthy. I was irredeemable. I was Garbage. But as I lay there, unwilling and unable to move, as I lay there, sinking into the grime and the filth, I soon realized that I was not alone. It was then that the vermin prince still forging ahead without looking back at his former master. It was then that he suddenly, unpredictably, turned a final corner. 
And upon rounding it himself, Master Ho found himself face to face with royalty. With the vermin prince, who now, for the first time since they met, wore a broad, crazed smile on his face, one that twinkled in the sickening yellow light that now filled the hallway, having emerged unnoticed by Ho, then grown and intensified. The vermin prince stood before the source of that light, backlit, surrounded, and caressed by it. He stood before a door, an ornate portal covered in ancient, eye-searing runes, a door carved into the very crystal that comprised the glowing veins that had spoken to Ho, that had empowered him and urged him forward. The vermin prince stood before that luminescent door, his arms outstretched, his mouth open to taste a triumph that only he could see. He looked Ho dead in the eye, and once again... He spoke. They found me, Ho. The rats and the roaches, the worms and the maggots, the vermin. They found me. They saved me. They nurtured and they nourished me. They spoke to me in their primal, hidden tongue. They gave me gifts for which there are no words in our deficient, too new language. And most importantly, they taught me. They taught me who I am, what I deserve, and what I am right to demand. He reached out, and with startling speed, he seized Ho's head, digging his thin, wiry fingers into his former master's temples, sending tendrils of a terrifying, comforting chill racing through his brain. And as Ho gazed in awe and in terror, as his glowing green eyes took on a more yellow hue, his former student flashed a masochistic, rictus grin and whispered the phrase that had been given to him and that he, in turn, gave willingly to all those who served him. I am the vermin prince, and I am no longer content with scraps. Thanks for checking out this best episode of Scald yet. If you're digging it, do the right thing and help other people find out about the only story that matters by leaving a review, either for the podcast version on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or for one of the numerous prose volumes available on Amazon. This one is for Volume 1, The One True King of Men. Pete says, The Only Story that matters. Aubrey Citizen has juxtaposed the wonderful old tradition of true oral storytelling with a useful new technology. It is recorded in one single flawless take, just as storytellers did around the Paleolithic fires. This is the only story that matters. Scald is a weekly show, which means that it's a weekly commitment from me, writing and recording these stories week in and week out. I love doing it, but it's a lot of time, and time that I'm not spending on paying work, like my comics writing. I don't want to have to stop Scald. I want to do it forever. But in order to do that, I need to justify the time spent with the money coming in. If you enjoy the show, head to patreon.com slash scald and throw a few bucks into the hat. Imagine that you're a traveling adventurer giving some coins to a bard who just entertained you in a tavern. It's more fun that way. Thank you in advance for helping spread the word about scald. In real life, on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, wherever you can get people listening to your effusive praise. Also, 